Welcome everybody to another um, event in our series, Questrom Insights. Today I uh, will talk about stock market insights and outlooks. Our guest is um, Jack Ablin. He is since 2018 the Chief Investment Officer of Crescent Capital. He has a 30 year experience in money management. He was at one point in time the Chief Investment Officer with BMO Harris Bank. He's also an author. He made the bestseller list of the Wall Street Journal in 2000, 2009 as the author of Reading Minds and Markets, Minimizing Risk and Maximizing Returns in a Volatile Global Marketplace. So very appropriate probably also for today. He was a professor at fi of finance at some point in time at um, what was then called the Graduate School of Management. That's now where we are, the Question School of Management, and he holds an MBA with honors from the School of Management um, at Boston University. My name is uh, Marcel Rinnisbacher. I'm the Dean of um, Faculty here and also a finance professor, and I will moderate this, ev this event and um, also um, try to get the questions from the students and then through the chat function and then yeah, ask Jack about um, his insightful answers. So, Jack, I turn it over to you. And Great. you'll start with um, yeah, some introduction about the economy, and then we will do um, questions after that. Great. Thanks, Marcel. And thank you, everyone, for joining the call today. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of fond memories uh, at uh, Boston University and try to stay connected. So it's a lot of fun. So what I do, what I do have is some prepared uh, remarks, and I have a uh, just a small presentation I want to use. So let's try that. Share that with you. Let me just get. Okay, well, I'm hopeful you all see that. Um, so what I'd like to do is just up, update everybody on uh, what we're thinking in terms of COVID, the economy, the markets. In fact, if you um, kind of put it in a, a framework, this is how we tend to look at it. Uh, first, we want to understand uh, the magnitude and the impact of the, the virus itself and its path. Um, Obviously, that's impacting uh, the lockdown and our slow uh, emergence from the lockdown. And as the uh, as the, uh, the virus ebbs and flows, that will also impact uh, the economy. And we're starting to get a sense of that. Um, and then once we have our arms around what the the uh, virus impact on the economy ultimately is, or a, a good sense of it. Then we can start looking at earnings, we can start projecting, we can start looking at valuation and better understand you know, what's expensive and what's cheap. Uh, right now, I would say uh, the, the stock market and the bond market is pretty much just trading like the bond market, essentially uh, looking for survivors and worrying about those that won't be able to make it uh, to the other side of this uh, gulch, so to speak. Uh, in terms of the virus itself, if you look at the, its growth rate uh, on a logarithmic scale, it looks like we're kind of peaking in growth. So the, the growth in the growth is flattening out, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, and that's really the next, the first step, I should say, in starting to perhaps emerge from this, uh, this lockdown we've been um, you know, it, it involved with for the last six weeks will likely last uh, at least eight weeks. Um, in terms of its impact on uh, the economy, um, you can see here, this is a chart that just looks at um, uh, the, the weekly uh, claims for unemployment insurance. This is a four week moving average. Historically, you can see these little trends higher tend to foretell recessions. And then we have, of course, this massive, unprecedented jump. Uh, so if you look at the four-week moving average, we're certainly at over uh, 5 million uh, unemployed. You take that 22 million uh, divided by the 155 million in the workforce, 
And already we're looking at, just right now, we're looking at an unemployment rate of somewhere between 14 and 15 percent. Um, let me just advance. Um, if you then kind of drill down somewhat and look at the, um, the, the jobs gained and lost by company size, probably this is a, a ADP data. They do the payroll processing, so they're pretty good handle on what's going on on a monthly basis. You can see um, virtually all of the job losses, at least in March, which was a partial shutdown month, um, was endured by companies of 50 employees or fewer. Uh, in fact, you can see uh, that the largest incremental gains came from companies of a thousand or more. Think about Amazon, think about uh, Walmart, uh, actually adding uh, 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 jobs to their payrolls. In terms of probability of recession, uh, I don't want to give the New York Fed uh, short shrift here. Their data is probably lagged, but according to the Bloomberg estimates, it's 100%. Uh, we will uh, have a recession as a result of the, uh, of the lockdown coronavirus and all the impact there. Um, on the GDP, this is for, um, time weighted, meaning that the most recent forecasts are given the most weight, assuming they're the freshest. And you can see we're looking at, at least for Q2, an annualized uh, decline of 25%. Now, uh, Congress and the um, Federal Reserve have certainly thrown a lot of stimulus at this issue. Part of the reason why I think the market is uh, in, in as decent shape as it is. Uh, so if you take, for example, um, central bank injections of nearly 5 trillion, add the 2.7 uh, trillion, and then we've just have a $600 billion bill that will likely be signed today. Um, already, even before this new bill, uh, we're looking at roughly 35% uh, of GDP in the form of some kind of stimulus or at least continuation uh, money. Um, I think the same you can see along most of the developed world. Um, overall, nearly 20% in the developed world. Um, where the concerns are, of course, is in the emerging world where uh, those countries don't have the wherewithal to print without depreciating their currency and they don't have the fiscal firepower to really uh, throw at the problem. Um, to date, my understanding is fiscal stimulus in India amounts to less than 1% of GDP. Um, last week, the lar five largest banks reported. Um, you can see their provisions for loan losses increased pretty dramatically on the scale that we haven't seen since the financial crisis. Uh, these five banks, you can see JP Morgan and Bank of America, Wells, uh, US Bank, uh, have uh, increased their loan loss provisions by $20 billion uh, in the March quarter. So that takes us to earnings and earnings estimates. Um, they've essentially fallen off a cliff going into 2020. Uh, analysts collectively had uh, penciled in roughly 4% uh, percent earnings growth for the S&P earnings for 2020 as a whole. Uh, that number is pretty much cascaded down to zero or even slightly negative, um, and that could go lower. So if we take that earnings growth and plug it into a very simple model that uh, I put together, you can see all in all, the S&P is now fairly priced based on a flat earnings growth for 2020. The model is pretty simple. The black line shows cumulative total return of the S&P 500. The gold line shows cumulative growth in dividends and earnings over the same period. The argument here is sort of like the, the master and the dog, right? The dog can kind of vary around the master over very short periods of time, but ultimately the dog's gonna follow the master along that path. Uh, and you can see that's pretty much what's going on. You've got the S&P kind of uh, gyrating around that central earnings and dividend growth line, but ultimately really can't get too far away 
without creating, you know, kind of a bubble or correction. You see um, periods of extreme, of course, the tech bubble in 2000, 1999, 2000, and even more recently going into 2020, uh, we had the S&P pretty far ahead of where earnings growth or earnings, true earnings were. However, we did have, oh, we have to remember, we did have a higher uh, earnings growth number going into the year, but nonetheless, the market was certainly overvalued. Um, so year to date, um, you know, if I, what I'm showing here is the, on the uh, vertical is just the year to date uh, return of the various equity markets. And then along the horizontal is the, just the valuation percentile relative to their last 15, 15 years. So you can see, you know, the dots over to the left are trading roughly in the, in the bottom decile of their historical range. I do use, in this case, I'm using trailing uh, price to earnings because like I said, we're not sure what forward earnings look like. Um, but the interesting thing is that US large caps still trading pretty healthily above its median level. My argument here is that equities are trading a lot like bonds, that investors are looking through the 500 stocks in the S&P, trying to identify companies perhaps that aren't going to make it uh, to the other side of coronavirus. Uh, and, and, and it's really just, in some cases, a, a matter of survival. And as you go down in market cap, and particularly in, in the US and, and foreign, um, the argument is a higher share of those indices may not make it to the other side, or at least that's what the perception is among investors. Um, turning our attention to bonds briefly, you can see this was a point um, Marcel brought up to me yesterday. I want to make sure I want to address, uh, and that the gold line shows corporate bond issuance. This is non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP. Um, and against that in gray are high yield bond spreads uh, with, of course, these recession bars. But what you'll notice is between, you know, 89 and say, you know, financial um, uh, quantitative easing in 2010, that um, corporate bond spreads tended to track uh, corporate bond issuance. Um, and then because of quantitative easing and because the Fed started to buy uh, in a big way, treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, that pushed would-be government buyers into the corporate bond market and would-be corporate investment grade bond buyers into the high yield market. And that financial repression created uh, a dampening of spreads, meaning that lenders weren't compensated completely uh, for the credit risk uh, that some of these bonds hold. Uh, and we have seen some spread widening in the last month or so, but I would argue it still doesn't compensate necessarily for the level of risk uh, in the corporate bond market overall. Um, last time I checked, and this was yesterday, that the implied default rate of high yield bonds is still around 10%, which I think is, is high by traditional standards, but low going into uh, an environment where um, economists expect the, the, uh, the economy to contract by a quarter, at least on an annualized basis. Um, this just shows um, the implications of passive versus active, active management. Uh, I've been a longtime proponent, as has Crescent, a longtime proponent of low cost passive strategies on the equity market largely because they've had done a great job of keeping costs low and outperforming most active um, and active managers. And you can see historically that the stock dispersion and essentially the daily standard deviation among, in this case, the S&P 100 has remained roughly at 1% or slightly below 1%, arguing that most stocks are moving together anyway. Um, the coronavirus and the lockdown, of course, has now created, even within the largest companies, winners and losers, and we can start to see their performance diverge. So think about Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple, you know, versus, say, Disney, which uh, owns a lot of theme parks, 
and Comcast, a universal which owns a lot of theme parks and some of the American Airlines, some of the large travel companies. And so what we're looking at is an opportunity here uh, over the last next few quarters for individual security selection and active management uh, to try to help navigate some of these um, uncertainties. Um, turning our attention back to uh, the lockdown and sort of the release, um, I've studied a lot of models uh, that uh, different um, jurisdictions uh, have tried to put together. And I, th I think the SEI, uh, SEIR model, which is really uh, promoted and will likely be used by the uh, United Kingdom, to me is the best. Um, what it does is it attempts to uh, bifurcate uh, its population into these four groups, susceptible, exposed to the virus, uh, and potentially contagious, uh, infections, it, you know, currently uh, fighting the, the disease, and then recovered with antibodies. This type of uh, process, virtually all of the processes that I've looked at in emerging from this lockdown require really two main things. One, testing, two types of tests. Um, there is a, a um, genomic test to look for the uh, DNA uh, tracers for the virus uh, in uh, looking for susceptible uh, exposed or infected uh, population. Um, and Abbott Labs and Roche have, are, are in the process of pioneering um, tests that the results will be, uh, can be administered locally and then the results back to you in minutes. Um, I'm not sure how many of these tests are available yet. The other test is an antibody test to determine who has recovered from coronavirus and who has the antibodies, largely be, the assumption being that those, that segment of the population um, will be immune. They can't uh, uh, spread it. Uh, and so they're gonna create this, this new um, uh, premium class, if you will, a preferred class of uh, employee that can actually be out in full force. Um, the other uh, requirement, of course, is tracking. Apple and Google are, are working on uh, tracking software for our phones so that if somebody is determined to be exposed or infectious that you can, they can presumably track who they come in contact with and try to isolate uh, those people as well. But the one thing you'll notice is in this, uh, this model with interventions, we will expect to see a pickup in infections once we start uh, you know, unlocking uh, our doors. I'm not gonna go into detail here. This is, a, this is a, a model my team updates every week with our base case, bear case, bull case. But what I'll tell you is on the top, uh, which is that the, the gray line was last week and the, the black line is this week, where we believe market participants are what they're assuming um, in their equity and bond market valuations. Uh, so you can see even still um, that um, market participants are, are split somewhere between what we would argue as base case and bull case, which suggests to me there may be some, still some room for disappointment um, as we start to navigate um, the rest of the year. Um, and then this just shows all the various asset classes and how they would perform under each of these scenarios. Um, I will say, um, you know, if you're interested in receiving these slides, I'll make sure to uh, uh, get them to Marcel and he can uh, forward them along to you. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, I just want to um, tell you what we've been telling our advisors and our clients is we, you know, first, we think that security selection is important in this environment as the market ultimately decides the winners and losers. Secondly, because liquidity is trading at such a premium right now, if you have liquidity, consider looking at private equity secondaries. This is a strategy that we use um, to buy private equity limited partnerships in the secondary market from uh, limited partner sellers who either want to reposition their portfolio or raise some liquidity. Uh, third, uh, again, for those who have uh, liquidity, 
Um, look for opportunities in distressed credit. Um, and you know this, th that sector has been really the, the Maytag repairman of the investment credit world for a while. And now they're, um, I'm sure their, um, uh, their pipelines and deal flow will start to uh, increase as we navigate this. Um, and then lastly, consider upgrades. Um, as we have these rallies upgrade from non-dollar to dollar because of the stimulus that we're able to afford from small to large because those larger companies have greater access to capital markets, raising equity and debt, and then from value to growth, which is really more moving away from companies that have high levels of debt toward growth companies uh, with lower levels of debt. So with that, let me uh, stop there and um, open it up. I just have to let my dog inside. Mm -hmm. I forgot she's in our backyard. I'll be right back. Excuse me. Okay, never mind. She's happy. She's happy out there. <laughs> That's important as well. So thank you very much for this um, oversight. I have sort of one question maybe to start the discussion at the time we accumulate more of the student questions or so. So when you look at all this model, like the one that you refer to the SEIR model, there are parameters that you plug in there. And some of these parameters are very non-precisely estimated and dependent on what you plug in there, you get them um, basically rebounds that are stronger or less strong. And do you, at the same time, when you look at the market, that's very positively reacted to the stimulus now. What do you think is the market getting it right also in terms of what could happen in a rebound and there be other stimulus packages? People just really are confident that the government has enough power to basically just um, do interventions that eventually will yeah help the market as it did now or why is that are, are people short-sighted what is the long term here well i think partially um investors are um you know tend to be optimistic they're always trying to look through things um they're looking beyond they're looking for that light uh i do think that you know 35 percent of gdp uh as stimulus is is uh, you know an enormous segment of the economy. You know, and, and even if you think about it, um, you know, I I, I kind of look at it as thirty percent of the economy, uh, uh, various industries in the economy are essentially stalemated. There's nothing happening there. Uh, hmm. Another thirty percent are are largely unaffected. Um, they could be you know professional services firms um, that can work remotely you know, accounting firms, things like that. And then that 60% in the middle, um, I'm sorry, that 40% that, that, that in the middle, um, you know, will be varying degrees of, of impact. So, um, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, we're, I just did a paper this morning uh, that was released, you know, looking at the various industries and where we think, you know, along the time scale, they'll get back to fair, you know, to new business. Uh, but, um, you know, there there may be certainly a lot of room for disappointment on the on the COVID side. Um, the question is, is there enough stimulus to offset it? You know, we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now given that we are here, I'm also having a lot of students, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit about sort of investment principles and how they play a role in the context of your decision making as an institution investor. For example, diversification is something that every student gets taught, the importance of diversifying risk. So what is the role of diversification in your investment strategy right now? Well, that's, you know what, Marcel, that's where there's, there's uh, differences between uh, textbooks and reality. Um, look, I love diversification. It helps you often, uh, but diversification didn't really help here. Uh, in fact, as we build our strategies and what we've done um, at, at Crescent and part of the reason why I left a large institution to help start Crescent is because we're taking a fresh look at how we want to build portfolios. Uh, and diversification, while it's important, it, I think investors tend to overly rely on it and then ultimately get disappointed from it. Um, where I think the best um, benefit really comes and and nothing to take nothing against 
diversification, although we assume as we build our portfolios, it isn't quite as beneficial as um, you know, the, the correlations, let's say, would suggest. Um, we look at time horizon. Uh, one of the things that, that we find is that if you're willing to hold an, uh, a risky asset, uh, as you extend your time horizon, the likelihood of making money increases. Uh, and so for us, uh, you know, what we do is we built a goals-based investing strategy. And what, what I mean by that is we essentially customize defined benefit uh, plans for our clients. They, they, give, they, they give us their portfolio. They tell us what their cash flow needs are now for the next, say, 40 years. Sometimes their cash flows are zero or negative, right? They're putting money in. Um, but we have three primary strategies. We have what we call a lifestyle strategy that's designed to deliver cash flows from zero to seven years, has no equities in it. Um, a, cash, a, a, a growth strategy designed to deliver cash flows from seven to 15 years, which is virtually all equities. And then a, 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 um, a, a strategy designed to deliver cash flows from 15 years and beyond, which has a lot of private investing. Uh, real estate, private equity, and, and thematic um, investing for a much longer term time horizon. For us, uh, you know, our strategy is predicated on not owning one share of stock unless we're in a position to hold it for seven years. And so for that reason, we can enter uh, a market like this, uh, knowing that seven years from now, COVID will be a, you know, a bad memory, uh, but we'll be beyond it. And you know our clients are not forced to sell uh, equities in a down market to have to meet their you know monthly um, cash flow needs. Okay, so you really take a long term perspective and don't really try to do sort of short term market timing by going in and out and things like that to basically try to have a better predictive model about where the virus is developing and or doing trading like this as well. Well, we do. We do have a tactical overlay, Marcel. I don't want to, you know, take away from that. Um, one of it is, so uh, our our lifestyle, which is the zero to seven year, we require we need a ninety five percent success rate in making money over any three year holding period, assuming what our capital market, you know, and we update our capital market assumptions all the time. The other is that we assume under that those circumstances that all risk assets in in credit move with a correlation of one. So we assume no diversification benefit among different risk assets. Um, that um, has been very solid for us and, and we're in good shape there. Our growth strategy requires a 90% success rate in making money over a seven year holding period. And there, uh, as, as we got into the second half of last year, we no longer could uh, convince ourselves that the market could deliver a 90% success rate. So either it was opportunistically or just because of the math, we took 15% out of our equity strategy and put it aside either in cash or in um, uh, what's called low beta, essentially hedged, mm -hmm. hedged equity strategies. And so as we entered 2020, we had a pretty nice 15% cushion in our growth strategy and now we're in the, re, uh, the process of deploying that back because now that the market has dropped as, had dropped as much as it did a month ago, our capital market assumptions allowed us to get back to that 90% success rate. So yeah, we do some tactical and again, the passive to active is certainly, I would argue, tactical. Uh, the upgrade is certainly tactical, but our main big picture allocations aren't you know, we don't change around on a quarterly basis. Okay, thank you so much. I'm starting to get questions. One question that you mentioned, you mentioned private equity as an asset class that you should think about. And I have a question here from one student about how do you really access private equity as um, an investor? What are sure. the kind of really opportunities that you have because it's illiquid and not necessarily open to everyone and are there ways you could get that also in terms of a retirement portfolio or things like that? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so there are ways, I don't know if you can gain access to private equity and what I'm talking about is private equity secondaries. Yeah. Much easier to access than private equity directly. Sure. 
Yeah, that's what the question was about, about secondaries. Yeah. And second, and, you know, and again, without, without blowing my own horn, but I, my firm has a fund, it's called Flowstone, that is a registered fund. It's an interval fund. I believe it's a quarterly interval fund uh, where I, I'm going to say it's probably a minimum investment of 250000 but I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I like about it is it, it, you can get, just like any fund, you can get pretty good diversification with one investment. Um, because it's, they're buying private equity secondaries, they're going to look at um, different sponsors, different industries, uh, different vintage years, when the investment was actually made. And so if you were trying to embark on building a private equity portfolio for yourself, knowing that um, each deal required a 250 thousand dollar minimum you need probably five deals to get adequate diversification if you're going to do different um, sectors and then you need three vintage years to be able to make sure you're diversified among the business cycle you know you're looking at a commitment um, of, of probably four or five million just to just in that one asset class and here private equity secondaries is the closest thing to a mutual fund it's like i said it's a registered vehicle interval fund uh where where essentially we do that for you okay very good so basically also there's a lot of um yeah global changes in geopolitics that may come there may be a change of the the, the supply chain in the world and so how do you think about them uh, really international investments so emerging markets europe asia is it something that um, you think there will be major shifts coming up and that is something that you already use today in terms of rethinking your um, investment strategy? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, in my view, coronavirus is a disease of globalization. Uh, in, I think it's an it's a indicator that perhaps that pendulum, which probably started in the early 1980s, when um, President Reagan fired the Patco workers and started dismantling the labor unions here at home and then opened the floodgates for companies to start sourcing all over the world, um, I think that pendulum probably swung too far uh, in that direction where, you know, perhaps business leaders and what I'll call the, the, the business side of globalization far and away outpaced the political side of globalization. Uh, and, and for that reason, I mean, think about, you know, we're, we've got uh, 3M, uh, a company, a Minnesota-based company that makes, makes the N95 masks uh, to protect, um, you know, our healthcare workers. Well, their plant's in Shanghai. And they, had to get permission, and I'm not even sure where this stands yet, because this was last week. They were waiting for permission from Beijing to, sh to send these masks to the United States. Um, and so none, I think, and we're already starting to get a sense of it from President Trump. He's, he wants to, you know, essentially shut off immigration, uh, at least temporarily. But there's this, you know, this, this notion to really just circle the wagons and close rank and try to bring, certainly we're gonna bring a lot of our important medical supply chain back home. Uh, last year, we purchased between five and $6 billion of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals from China. And I think that, you know, the coronavirus has exposed a vulnerability that we don't wanna to have to live through again. Yeah. And other countries, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, do you then think about what is sort of the future of um, emerging markets in that context? So it's so very much driven by what the dollar will do, and the dollar is very much driven by also how the Federal Reserve will do intervention policies and so on. So how do you think about emerging markets? Sure. So let's talk about emerging market bonds. You're right, uh, Marcel. Emerging market bonds is a big bet against the dollar for two reasons. One, um, you know, if you're an emerging market bond holder in the U.S., and emerging market bonds are denominated in um, local currency, then the value of those bonds will, will drop if the dollar accelerates, if the dollar increases in value. Um, 
If, uh, but we also know that nearly half of emerging market bonds are denominated in US dollars um, for that reason. But consider a case where the US dollar accelerates a lot. Uh, companies that may have the wherewithal to pay their loans in local currency now may find themselves uh, struggling to pay those same debts in US dollars because they're earning their revenues in their local currency and having to pay their interest and principal in US dollars. So that, that squeezes. So you can see owning as, an, as a US based or dollar based investor, um, owning emerging market bonds, you really do wanna see a, a, at least a stable or weaker dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is, you know, emer generally speaking, emerging market countries are you know, younger um, and they're earlier on that uh, wealth uh, acceleration. And, you know, perhaps like China uh, can create now a whole population of domestic uh, demand. And, and so instead of relying purely on just, you know, low productive, dirty manufacturing, you know, pumped out into the rest of the world, um, that actually they can create product that their own population uh, can consume. Um, and so I think China's close to that level. Uh, India probably still a little farther away, um, but a lot of the Asian Pacific countries are are in a much better position, I believe, than say, um, you know, the the um, um, Indias of the world um, and perhaps some of the Latin American countries too. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, the sector mix coming out of um, COVID, sort of where do you really see the biggest movement? So what are really the sectors that coming out of this crisis you should um, pay much more attention to compared to the past? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it, it, if you're looking for the accelerant, um, obviously, you know, depending on how you want to, how do you want to play it, um, you know, the travel business has certainly been essentially effectively sidelined. Uh, a report that we um, published this morning suggests that, you know, we don't see uh, travel, international travel, uh, getting back to any sense of, um, you know, normal capacity until um, even after this time next year. Um, so, um, you know, I think if, if, if you wanna play um, that sector, you know, you obviously you're going to have to to look for the uh, you know the the survivors. I mean, that's that's really just a sort of a discriminant analysis there. Um, uh, in terms of um, in terms of tech, um, I think tech is shown to be not only you know con will continue to lead the way for the U.S. and um, I think for for the world, um, but also biotech, which really hasn't. Um, you know, performed as well in recent years, I think will likely get, um, you know, a, a new found respect. Uh, and then I think as we look at our private healthcare system, um, you know, I think there, I think America has now realized there's a difference between private healthcare and, 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 um, and, and public healthcare. Mm -hmm. And um, so I do think that we're going to find that there will be a motivation to provide some basic healthcare coverage to every American just for uh, everybody's safety uh, and, and in an organized way. So I do think that healthcare is going to be um, revisited and, um, and, and, you know, I probably don't want to own healthcare insurance companies uh, yeah. after COVID. In terms of sort of cost, do you see telemedicine as really being a big thing in terms of how the cost structure of the healthcare industry or the will, will change? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, you know, it's been, it's been a trend that's been in place for a few years and now it's accelerated. I, I also think that, um, you know, venues like this, just uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing, I think that, <clears throat> you know, where clients may have been, um, you know, felt that, you know, if you didn't visit them in a person, it wasn't a true visit, I think are gonna be a little more understanding. Uh, that that really maybe changes the, the logic for regional offices. You know, it may be that um, office space in general is, is not, you know, as in big demand as 
more and more people may be inclined to work from home. Um, it may be that, you know, downtown apartment that's walking distance to your office, which happens to be, you know, great location for work, but cramped. Um, it may be that, um, you know, workforce um, reconsiders that and may consider looking at, um, you know, moving into, moving out away from their office, knowing that they don't have to go in every day. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think, they, but I will say, you know, on the real estate side, you know, long-term leases and the commercial real estate will likely prevent any kind of wholesale <clears throat> turnover upside down. Um, but I think these are trends that will play out over the next, you know, decade or so. Mm -hmm. Now I have a sort of more a selfish questions because I'm working in higher education. We have a lot of the risk that companies are exposed to. The higher education in the US has grown a lot by admitting more international students and that's more problematic. We see, we see sort of like a real change in technology. We are, have learned in three days or so to deliver a Zoom class. So there's a lot of also private equity investment in sort of online learning and so on. So what is your outlook on higher education in the United States? Yeah, I think, I do think that higher education uh, is certainly will, will remain important in a, obviously in a knowledge-based economy, higher education is critical, but I do think you're right, Marcel. I think that this trend that we saw toward, um, toward distance learning and, and, you know, this video interaction, which, you know, has been resisted by a number of kind of in, incumbent parties um, will now, it's, it's sort of like the genie's out of that bottle. I think that, um, I think that I know, my, you know, my uh, uh, two uh, daughters who both graduated from college also had, at least somewhere along their college experience, had taken um, an online class here or there, um, and they're comfortable with it. Um, and um, I, so I do think that that's going to be a new reality. I also think that um, possibly that um, students or, or, or the workforce looking to attain a specific job may decide that a four-year uh, college degree uh, may not be worth the, the effort. Uh, and in, in a world now where companies are rewarding for specific skills, and I think that we'll, we'll start to see certificates nano degrees and certain certificate programs uh, you know, emerge. Um, I mean, the CFA to me, which is uh, a program I did uh, back in the, while I, actually while I was at BU, um, was, uh, you know, that's, uh, to me, that, that, that's got, you know, the gravitas in the industry and, it, you know, it's a self-paced program. So mm -hmm. I think there, I think there is um, some traction there. But I also think that, you know, the four-year degree and, and, and business degree, I mean, it's certainly not going to go away. But I, I think that ultimately, what, it, what we wrote about this morning was, we'll see two experiences, we'll see an online, uh, we'll see an online experience, and we'll see an on campus experience. And I think that universities, if they're flexible enough, can offer the same degree with those two different experiences and probably different price points when it comes to tuition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we have a lot of students at the moment worrying about their yeah, job market, where do I work and so on. You have been in industry in a long time and see other recessions, up and downs and so. So what kind of advice would you give um, students who are really worried about how to approach even the job search and what kind of principles that you think they should really focus on? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is, uh, you know, it is uh, problematic. I know when I graduated college in, um, 1980 uh, wasn't it wasn't a great job market, um, but um, you know I majored in mathematics and computer science and and ended up working in uh, Washington D.C. for a firm that was it was a consulting firm that our job was to come up with the a, a national gas rationing program. I mean, think about how you know we can't give gasoline away now. Um, but in those days, we were trying to come up with um, these vouchers that allowed people to have a certain amount of gas. Um, so it, it, I've seen a lot of difficult times, but um, 
I, I also know that you know if you can somehow latch into certain companies uh, that you you'd want to be engaged with, I would do it because what I find is uh, if you can prove yourself in a company, you have a ton of um, uh, of flexibility and mobility within the company. I believe. You're a valuable contributor. I mean, I, I even in our company, I, I, one of the guys that works in my group now came in as as kind of a um, you know an investment report administrator, and this guy um, you know he proved himself, and he's he's now doing some really interesting work for us. Mm -hmm. In terms of sort of more specifically in finance, what do you think are really the skills that somebody should really focus on to get into the financial, is it quantitative skills? Is it really more understanding the big economic picture or is it a combination of both? Yeah, to me, you know, I, while, while I'm encouraging our clients to move into active management, uh, I also recognize that, um, you know, passive is still a trend that, that will likely prevail. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily encourage anyone to go out and become, you know, a, a mutual fund portfolio manager. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities. There's still, you know, if think about the, just the number of, of private companies, small businesses, real estate, um, anyone interested in security analysis or equity investing um, should consider looking at private equity or, or real estate, um, that's always going to be in demand. Not every company wants to be public or can be public. Um, and with the with a lot of the restrictions and Sarbanes-Oxley and all the other restrictions on public markets, um, companies will stay private. And so, um, and that's a, a big part of what we do. We do private real estate, private equity, private mm -hmm. equity secondaries, but of course then public markets too. But for us, we look at it more as risk allocation um, than individual, you know, security selection. Okay. So in terms of sort of machine learning, artificial intelligence, is that, are these skills that somebody interested in finance should focus on? Or is it really, depends where you go, obviously, for private equity, and so it may not be really valuable in any way, but it's our, in general, what is your view on this? Because sometimes yeah. in a world where computer scientists claim they can do everything, and um, maybe um, that's true for certain things, but not necessarily for certain things we do in finance, you need to- Yeah, I think that, you know, what I find is that, you know, anything that um, has any semblance of, of success will ultimately become overcrowded um, and then end up, you know, pushing things too far in in whatever direction so um yeah i think it could be successful for a little while um, um but you know if there's just any success it just breeds um your competition um so it's a it's a it is a, a pure kind of capitalist endeavor for us what we'll, you know we use quantitative skills to build portfolios to try to deliver as much certainty in an uncertain world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to, you know, deliver what we'll do is put a frontier together on the vertical axis would be probability of success to deliver a set of cash flows. And then along the horizontal would be the amount of capital you commit to your portfolio. As you would imagine, it's sort of an asymptotic function that as you commit more capital, you know, you'll go from zero up toward, you know, 90, 95, and then that, you know, that, that incremental value to go from 95 to say 99 or 100 requires more and more capital to deploy. And so our job is to figure out where on the frontier, working with clients, where they want to be. Um, you know, some just want to, you know, belt and suspenders approach and put it away. Others want to try to um, deliver those cash flows with the fewest number of assets possible. And what that does is it then frees up other assets for mm -hmm. things like, you know, multi-generational, impact, charitable, um, you know, any kind of aspirational, um, you know, outlook they have. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the time and, that, and all the great um, conversations we have. This is sort of like also a benefit that people are reachable. They didn't have, they didn't have to fly here and come to the classroom. And um, 
it's a really opportunity that we try to also exploit more. And I'm really thankful to have yeah, people like you around who basically. My, my pleasure. Oh, I would love to come. I'd love to come up there when the Red Sox are playing. So we'll have Definitely to. We'll try to do that as well, because I think that's still also an important part. And um, you're always welcome back to uh, basically visit your alma okay. mater. And then it's a really great conversation. So great. All the all right. best and um, stay safe. And for all the students as well. So. Thank you for participating and um, we will try to make the slides available if that's okay with you. Sure, I'll forward them all along. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, be posted for the next events in this series. Um, and I hope we can provide you with some service that otherwise you don't get when you're in the classroom alone. And so stay safe as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.